All right, so we're going? Yep. All right, I'm going to clap us in. Here we go. Hey, welcome to the Fireside Tattoo Network. I'm Jake. This is Rimber Oriana. Or, or, I can't roll my I can't roll my <laughs> R's. Rimber Oriana. Oriana. I, I sound ridiculous when I try to roll my <laughs> R's. <fine. laughs> uh, so um, we're here this final day at uh, at the Evergreen Tattoo Invitational. You killed it yesterday. Got best of the day with this giant thigh piece. It was beautiful. I got to look at it for a long time. Thank like, you. Thank you. It looked great. Um, uh, and you were also taught a. Um, I uh, taught a seminar in the educational before the yeah before on Thursday the, yeah on Thursday. So what what was the what was the seminar about? Well, um, you know, it was mainly black and gray and, and and color, right? Like a little bit of like a mixture, like how yeah. to you know put like a, a black and gray on my color. Yeah. But uh, since I knew there there were gonna be some seminars before me, you know, explaining black and gray, and then we had Nico on the same day and stuff. I was trying not to focus too much on, on, on just the realism, you know, not, not only on the realistic part, but um, I think one of the characteristics that uh, make my work stand out is like dimension. I like playing a lot with, you know, dimension and, and uh, um, I just like, I like to make tattoos look like they're like inside the skin sometimes yeah. or that you can kind of like reach and, and grab them. So yeah. it was focused on that, more more on that, you know, more explaining how to work with uh, different planes, like different layers and stuff like that, man. Uh, yeah. Um, I spent a few days trying to get ready for it, man. Uh, but 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 I made a lot of notes, and then like when I got there, I got pretty nervous at, at the beginning. Yeah. It was a lot of people. Like I was like standing in front of everybody, and, and I got a little nervous. And I was like going through. Go. Uh, I was trying to go through my notes and stuff, and, and I was like, man, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it got better. Like once I started tattooing, you know, it got a lot better. I was able to explain. I got some good feedback so you got from to, people. And you were talking as you were tattooing. Yeah. Well. F yeah. Uh, I, I, kind of like uh, broke it down into like three parts like I brought some like pre-recorded like material mm -hmm. so uh, when I was back home I started this tattoo on this guy and I record you know the beginning of it and then he just came back uh, um. with me so I, I explained a little bit of the process and then then I did some live tattooing at the end like yeah. for about an hour hour and a half and yeah. I feel like uh, they got more out of me tattooing than anything else because when they mo most most of the artists they're more like visual like right. they like seeing you how you're doing it so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. T talk for a second about that because what you do is actually is, is is pretty tricky when you have a lot of black and gray that's a focal point and then you use pops of really intense color in the background and if you're not careful and paying attention to your values especially that that color could could easily overwhelm the black and gray that that that's your foreground like for example the the piece that you did yesterday on the thigh mm -hmm. so the focal point is this really beautifully re rendered black and gray figure and then you've got this organic stuff with bright like intense blues cutting through how do you keep those from competing with each other well what the like what i what, I, what i'm imagining when i'm putting those pops of color is almost like like if you're seeing a tunnel or something, and then at the end of the tunnel you see a little bit of light. Mm -hmm. So even if the light is bright, it has all that dark around it. Yeah. That it just makes it look like, uh, you know, I'm just trying to stretch the layers a lot more. So I'm using, you know, the stuff in the in, in, in the foreground, you know, some things to, to create some flow. Then I always put my main subject in the midground. And then I like to put, you know, dark stuff around the, 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 the main subject. But then... After the dark, I like to have another layer, you know. So that's where I use some of the color, some like the some of the pops of the color and stuff. So yeah. that's where it helps. So, so you're thinking about uh, the one thing that can get confusing in that is is you have kind of multiple light sources you're dealing with, right? You have the light on the figure, and then you have the light in the f the intense light in the far background. Yeah, well, the, the the light doesn't really interact with the main piece. It's like it's so bar so far back that it's almost like. Uh, uh, independent from from everything else, so yeah. you only see it at you know like at the end. Like I said, if you were looking at a tunnel, and then at the end you see kind of light, mm -hmm. like that light wouldn't do nothing if it's like from from far away. Yeah. But um, but a lot of it, man, is is more since since I'm doing everything uh, more uh, surrealistic. Mm -hmm. Not that it doesn't necessarily has to make sense, but I, I'm playing with with the dimension on the main subject as if it was like an indoor kind of like light source mm -hmm. and then uh, and then I'm and I'm doing the surroundings almost like uh, if it was some on some kind of like atm atmosphere yeah. uh, you know like atmospheric perception you know so you see right. as, as the stuff goes back it gets more like faded and stuff so yeah. I'm kind of like playing with two things that are not supposed to be together but you know that's the it's a realistic part of it, basically. Yeah, yeah. So. and it's a very, very unique look. And I, th I think that a lot of the organic stuff that you're using to fall into the skin gives that effect that you were talking about, where it looks like you can kind of reach into the, reach into the skin, uh, where you kind of like you, you, you strategically kind of pull skin. Yeah, uh, into, into the main it. subject. Yeah. And also uh, try to play with the temperature of the color. So sometimes, 
sometimes I do use like red colors and warm colors in the background, mm -hmm. but then I, I, I put like blue eyes on the main subject or something like that. Yeah. And uh, on, the, on, on that one, I did, uh, you know, that like turquoise green that I like using a lot. Yeah, and then yeah. uh, and then I did like orange and, and, and red eyes. So, you know, the, the warm color like pops more anyway. So Yeah, yeah. Do you find that it's that it's even more important to make sure that all of your grayscale work is really fully saturated and blended well and then you have a, a full value range within the gray part so that the color part doesn't overwhelm the the black and gray yeah and and, and more than anything like if if we were to take a picture of that that uh, that piece uh, in, in black and white uh, everything in the background is pretty soft so mm -hmm. I'm focusing on the edge edge the control a lot so yeah. So I'm focusing on making sure that the main the main piece has all of the values, and that's that's something that I was uh, teaching at the seminar. How uh, if we want the main subject to get all the attention, then I'm, I'm, I, I place with I try to like use the full uh, grayscale on it. So I, I try to have all my black blacks and highlights on the main subject and really sharp edges in a few places. And then as you go back, everything gets softer, and I probably don't use. I, I do use black. That's that's the only exception sometimes. Uh, but then I don't, I don't. I try to kill all the skin and no highlights in the background. So. Yeah, yeah. So just and just to keep the main subject in focus more than anything. And your edges get softer and softer as it, they they, as they do. They yeah, yeah. That, that's something that I've been playing with it, uh, lately. More edges and stuff. I took a few seminars from like. Uh, David Kazan and yeah. uh, he's a he's a really good yeah, good painter. Really good. Yeah, we yeah, had him on the show a year or two ago, and it was it was a great great episode. He, um, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I no, really no, enjoyed no, it. No. Yeah, yeah, but it, I mean, in, on top of being a cool guy, man, it was just like so much information. Like he's as he's painting, he's just talking and talking. So yeah, it can get a little overwhelming, but it's great. I mean, it was a great. Uh, yeah, he he had an interesting um, uh, perspective that I'd never heard before. I always think about like what we're talking about, trying to focus the your attention on one part of the of the composition, and he renders everything fully, like all of the wrinkles in the skin, all the wrinkles in the knuckles, and the you know every, everywhere. And you look at his paintings, and you're like, wow, everything is in focus. And uh, I asked him about that, and he said, well, I, I paint everything life-size so that it's almost like you and I sitting here, and I, I can pick whatever I want to focus got on. It, got he it. said, I don't think that would work if I painted quarter size. He said, yeah. well, because I paint everything so large, that's why I can get away exactly. with focusing everything. And, and, and also, like, in his work, he's dealing more with, like, focusing everything on the main character. Like, the, the, the subject is the main yeah. thing. And that's something that in my work is the same thing. Like, we, we got, like, great art, artists, like, you know, uh, like Nico or Ralph Noir, those guys that focus on, on the portrait being super realistic, right? Mm -hmm. So they, 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 they can they can do that. They can just focus on that and making sure it's real. But me, uh, the, the the face sometimes is just one more element mm -hmm. of, of the whole thing. So I don't really focus on rendering everything too perfect because I'm dealing with placing more em ele elements in there and I want everything to get a little bit of attention. Yeah. Like yeah. more composition, you know, when a composition wise, uh, I was reading something that uh, it says like, if you have all of the attention on the main subject, it also doesn't work. You always want to introduce another element to kind of like compete for attention with mm -hmm. that one. And that way your eye is like bouncing back and forth and you keep the, the whole painting more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. That, was, that, was, that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that is. What, what about your preparation method? Are you drawing mostly digitally? Are you drawing on paper? What's uh, when, uh, for, for, for tattoos or for, for other work? Whatever. Yeah. How do, you, how do you prepare? Man, I, I, I used to... Uh, do a lot of freehand, uh, just like let's say placing an image that I like, and then I was just like drawing on the skin. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, la lately I've been I've been using more the iPad Pro, ju just because you can play more with the whole rendering, and it's it's actually making me a lot faster. Because I think when I when I do the freehand, it's cool, it's nice, because you, you it's just like straight from your head to the skin. But uh, you're also having to do a lot more uh, thinking as you're tattooing, so that takes a little bit away from it. Especially, yeah. I, I take my time. I'm really slow. Yeah. So if I if I have the, the whole design ready, I'm basically just. I mean, I already did the whole uh, um, creative part of it, you know, on the digital part, and then I'm just translating that into tattooing. Right. You know, so it's, right. it's a lot faster. It's better for the client as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah. So you you've gotten over time where you you more fully prepare. You're not kind of solving. Most of your big drawing problems are solved well before you get exactly, to the skin. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that way I can judge. Okay, I need to push those those things more, and mm -hmm. I, th I need to bring this forward. Like I said, it's not a portrait. You know, a lot of the stuff is abstract. But even then, like the light sources have to make sense, and everything mm -hmm. has to have you know good good dimension. So you know, at the end, when I used to just like freehand stuff, I had to like step back and start pushing more stuff, mm -hmm. bring more more stuff forward, and go back and forth. But uh, also the skin. Sometimes you like you already work so much on an area, and then if you try to like push that again. 
it just yeah. can't. So, so, so now having that is, is a lot better, like easier on the skin and stuff, heals better. And Yeah. Are you working the entire tattoo kind of as a whole, or do you like to finish sections before you've addressed other sections Yeah, since, since most of my tattoos take two days in a row, um, most of the times what I do, and and, 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 I, and I've been doing this on, on all of my clients now, I, every piece I do, I almost like to do it in two days. Mm -hmm. So so what I do, I place the stencil, and then I finish, you know, like the, the section from the bottom start going going up, mm -hmm. and I finish everything, uh, even highlights, color, and all that. Sometimes I leave the highlights out, but uh, only if, if they're not too close, you know, to skin where they're gonna hurt or something. Yeah. So I just try to finish everything, and then the next day, I try to put like thick ointment on the part that I tattoo, so that, that I can put like a paper towel on top of it, mm -hmm. and I just like use a lot of tape, just tape it. If you put plastic, your stencil is gonna, you know. Uh, a wipe away uh, yeah. and I guess some people do it where they place the stencil back on there but it, it's a pain that you yeah, know like, it, like yeah, yeah just trying to line it up so yeah. I just do that man I, I just put some like a, pla uh, a paper towel on it tape it really really good so nothing gets in there and then the next day you can even clean the skin with uh, with soap uh, uh. just to make sure it's like sterile again and the stencil won't wipe away because huh. It's been there for a whole day, and, oh. and I just like keep keep on working and That's on it. It's interesting. I've never heard the approach of, of using a paper towel instead of plastic wrap, but it makes sense. So it just like it holds onto the stencil a little better. Yeah, overnight. but but like I said, so I don't get the paper towel to stick on the tattoo. I just put like really thick put, ointment on yeah. it, and uh, and it's yeah. been working pretty well so far. And like I said, you can keep the skin clean because you can clean it afterwards. So yeah. not worry about the skin not being sterile. Yeah. Yeah, do you and, and so that's something that would be a lot harder for you to do if you were still drawing on the skin and solving problems as you, uh, as you go. Because like the way I think of um, uh, of approaching a larger piece like that, like a lot of times I don't know how light I want the chin until I've addressed the forehead. You know what I mean? I'm kind of looking at the whole thing at yeah. once. But because you're doing so much preparation, you know. Uh, you can finish something from here to here yeah. and, and without really knowing what's happening up here yet. Yeah, and, and, and even then, I mean, obviously, after you finish the section, you can still kind of, like, come yeah. back, but it's a lot less adjustments, you know, yeah. because, uh, like they say, like, painting or tattooing is a series of, of adjustments, right? You, you're mm -hmm. constantly, like, judging. You're constantly asking if it's right or wrong. So I still come back and adjust. But uh, but also, like, something I've been doing, too, is I'm, I'm uh, when I pre-dilute my ink, I'm really making sure that I know at all times what value I'm picking up mm -hmm. with the machine. Like I'm, I'm, yeah. doing, I'm doing a lot less guessing as I'm tattooing. Mm -hmm. So I look at a value and I'll, I'll right away identify, okay, this is like a mid-tone, this is a mi medium dark, medium light. And then I pick that color, you know, on the ink and I just like place it on there. So yeah. more, more, more saturating, more the, the, uh, the black and gray, almost like if it was color. Yeah. That, that was something I was doing on my seminar, explaining the difference between rendering the colors more a la prima where you just put the tone in there and make sure it's right mm -hmm. or slowly like building it up until you get it right like mm. uh, you know like both things work out depending on what you're trying to do yeah yeah but yeah it's, but it, and in that case you have to be pretty careful you're not really mixing you know you're not like hitting your dark gray blending a little and then lightening it and blending a little you're having to make sure that you're that you're yeah your tube is very clean familiar with what i'm doing man yeah. like getting familiar with with the tones i'm using with the same ink and stuff like a lot of people ask hey uh is it better to get like pre uh pre-mixed ink or what or you know want? do it yourself and mm -hmm. i'm like it's not it's not a matter of wh which one is better it's a matter of like which one can can you get you get used, used to it you mm -hmm. know so if you're getting used to the same thing and you're using that all the time i mean it's, it's gonna be good i mean yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying not to adjust right because we're constantly doing it but just right. get familiar with your tones so that you can be more uh confident yeah. as you're picking up a color and then just putting it on the skin yeah. are, are you trying to simplify or reduce the total number of values like are you do you have a a five or six step grayscale from black down or do you try to limit it to just um three or four or? not really man I'm, I'm really trying to if anything uh introduce more and more of, of the value scale so uh I'm, I'm breaking down my ink and, and that's something i also did on my seminar where i was i pulled out the whole uh, value scale let's say like the the, the nine shades you know, from like the three mid, uh, three three darks, three mid tones, and three light tones, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then I explain like if you were to translate that into ink cups, how will you set up your ink cups and and uh, so you can uh, pick a color exactly like okay this is a you know like medium dark and then pick up that color and put it on there and mm -hmm. and what it will be that color and yeah. obviously that, that you you will have to adjust that depending on the skin the skin color and stuff right. like that right but but yeah I'm trying to use. A lot more value, so just, just so that I can stretch more, uh, yeah. you know, the dimension of it. Yeah. Especially because sometimes I want to place things uh, in the background, and then some of them in between, you know, mid ground and background, so they change just like slightly. Mm -hmm. So if I'm only using uh, 
yeah, a true. limited you know amount of tones, then it's gonna everything's gonna look too close together. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, going going back to to doing seminars and teaching, are, are, do you find your do you find yourself like when you finished the seminar the other day? Do you instantly go back and make notes of like, what you could have said better, what, what you might change? Are you or, or is it something you're trying to do more of, or trying to become more of a more of a teacher? Or are you? Yeah, I, I definitely I definitely want to do it more, man. I, I gotten so used to it from. Uh, like I said, I have a shop with uh, with uh, with 20 artists, yeah. and I'm constantly just promoting uh, the whole environment of, of the shop as everybody trying to push each other, right? right? Like we don't we don't have that where we learn something, we want to keep it to ourselves because we've been being so competitive. Mm -hmm. We're all in the more creative mindset, right? So therefore, we open it up for for everybody to be creative as well, and we're all like learning from each other. So. It has become a thing where the culture is really nice. It's more like a family, and I'm and I'm yeah. getting out of context here. I'm more, more no, talking that, about the, the, the shop in general. I was gonna I was gonna move to that because that's amazing. You have 20 artists. You said you have seven apprentices. Apprentices, yes, yes. So how what what is that what is that environment like? I mean, obviously, you really have to have a lot of a lot of systems and processes in place in order for that to yeah, work. Yeah, uh, but that, but that's the thing, right? Like like you're saying, a system. A uh, focus on developing a system over the over the years and. Mm -hmm. We, we, we've been open for close to four years, but I think like the, the main thing that helps is like from the beginning, I've been working with uh, uh, Francisco Sanchez, he's my business partner. Okay. We both uh, own the shop and that, that has made a big difference because me and him, from the beginning, we started tattooing together. Mm -hmm. So we start from tattooing at a little shop in a, one of those shopping centers, like a bazaar, you know, just like doing uh, small walk-ins, you know, trash tattoos, to we move on to a kind of like a better shop and then from there, me and him try to look for like the, the most professional shop that we could find in, in the place, you know, over there in Dallas. Um, he, uh, the name of the shop, like Cat Tattoo, uh, owned by this guy, Terry Mayo. And uh, he had a really good system and he's been doing it for a long time. And he was starting to target the really high end clientele. So he had a, he had a great system on how to manage, you know, our, our clients and, and the workers and stuff. But, but we, we saw a lot of, I don't want to say flaws, but a lot of things that we, we thought that they would be different to make everything instead of be too much like a business and where people will have a view of you of oh he's the owner he's just trying to make us work and have just trying to make money out of us we wanted to make something where they saw us as as an example of you know like in a leader but not in a way like that like we my understanding of leadership is like you're there to like serve people and to do things so they you know to inspire them right mm -hmm. like that's my, my understanding of that so me and him like like try to do that all the time man like we we're the we're the ones i get i get to the shop uh really early like at 9, 8 30 a.m because i like i like working early now cause especially because i do th those long sessions mm -hmm. but sometimes i gotta stay there until after they close the shop like at 3 a.m or something oh, man. so wow. i do like 18 hour sessions and me and him we're always the last ones working and and we always try to show them like, like look no because like we own this place and, and 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 we're making a decent living means that we're slowing down like this is our passion and we want to like do as much as we can like that's why we're here traveling and doing all these shows and doing these big pieces and still trying to not nah, like i don't i don't try to win awards to prove anything man but i just like like to inspire like the people that that surrounds me and stuff mm -hmm. like that right the people that looks up to me uh just to show me hey, man you don't have to lose that uh uh, a passion for it you know even after yeah. years even even after you're like making good money or whatever yeah so at all times we're trying to promote that man like we develop a system where we we uh we try to see everybody as family like from the apprentices to the ones who makes the most money mm -hmm. we treat them all the same and we don't allow anybody else to treat the apprentices mm -hmm. in a bad way like i'm always taking care of them i'm always like trying to make them really progress i'm like uh uh, uh I, I, like I said, I pay uh, Kazan to go down there and teach us for a whole week mm. just so we can have like that kind of a structure in oh, the shop. Yeah. Every Wednesday we have our classes. I pay this, this lady. Uh, she's a great teacher from England that I've been learning from oh. her for uh, years. And uh, <laughs> so I pay her every Wednesday to go there. And like whoever wants to take the class, they, they don't have to pay nothing. They're wow. there like taking classes. And uh, I'm, I'm constantly like taking the whole shop. Like uh, I'm going to be in Hell City in uh, Arizona. And I asked her, hey, man, get me like five boots in a row yeah. and i'm paying for everything just to bring my whole shop just so they can start getting connections so you, just, just so they mm -hmm. can start being inspired by like other artists and stuff so yeah. so I, I do all of this in a, a genuine way right like i'm yeah. I, i'm not doing it like oh yeah i want i want to gain respect from them that way i just do it because i really want to help them learn i, I really want to be surrounded by good artists because they make me be a better artist mm -hmm. as well like they don't know it but they they inspire me a lot because i see them progress from the apprentices like some of them they 
they, 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 they look like they didn't have a chance being a tattoo artist, and now they, they're great mm -hmm. artists. So yeah. things like that inspire me and makes me want to keep on going. So that, that's why it's like a mutualism, you know, like yeah. we, we both, like, feed, like we, everybody feeds off of each other. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, it's like they say you're the average of the people you spend, the five people you spend exactly. the most time around or whatever. Exactly. And so if, if, you can, if you can culture an environment where everyone is, is raising the bar together, yeah. um, then that's the best case scenario. And it really only takes one person that's, that's dragging or one person that's not, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's not performing up to standards or that's lazy to kind of affect an entire a 20 artist shop, you know? Yeah, so it's, yeah. Uh, and then that, that's something else, man. I feel like a lot of shop owners, they're always focusing on, man, I want to keep all these people working for me like as long as I, I can, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't want to teach him. They don't want him to like do seminars. They don't want him to do like shows because they don't want him to get that exposure because they mm -hmm. feel like that person is like one of their, like they own that person, right? And they right. want to keep him there. Like me, even if I know a lot of them, I help them from the beginning, and I don't like I don't like to say it, but I help them from the beginning. I want to see them with a gun. I'm like, man, like guys, I, I wanna, I wanna, I want you guys to come to me and be like, you know what? I I wanna open up my own shop, like, or I wanna just travel around and and you know, like just tattoo, cause I already got a name for myself, and and so so I got a really uh, nice system at the shop. I think like I, since we have a lot of walking clientele, cause we focus on the advertising and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have my apprentices, right? And then uh, as they learn more and they get good, they become uh, a walking, walking, you know, artist. Mm -hmm. Then as the walking artists progress, they become appointment only. Mm -hmm. Then as the appointment only guys, you know, get better, I'm always like, guys, if you're ready to go, go. But it seems like they just want to stick around. They want to stay <laughs> there. They're like, yeah. man, I'm not, I'm not making, I could be making more money tattooing, you know, somewhere else, paying to a studio that's uh, pay, charging me rent. Yeah. But I don't want to leave this family. I don't want to leave, you know, what I'm learning here. So I'm constantly trying mm -hmm. to bring things to the table because you know how they say it. If you're the smartest one in the room, you're the, you know, you're in the wrong room. Right. So I don't want anybody there to be the smartest one in that room. I, you know, I want to yeah. always have people better than them in a way so that they feel like they want to be there and they want to, like, keep on working. So a lot of owners ask me, man, like, why you do, like, why you do that, man? Why are you giving them, like, so much? They're going to just leave. And I'm like, and that's what I want, man, because by the time they leave, my, my walking uh, uh, artists are going to be like tattooing up. and then my, my apprentices are going to be like, you know, like doing walkings by, by that time. So it's just a cycle, right? Mm -hmm. the, it never ends. Like I don't ever see that like, oh, the artists are going to leave and I'm, I'm going to leave be left with no one. Right. As, long as, as long as I keep working and keep making sure they're progressing, I'm just going to see them like, you know, leaving and I'm, I mean, mm. I, I'm not going to lose any friends with that anyway. Yeah, you know, no, so. absolutely not. Do you, uh, having that number of apprentices, does everyone work under a single mentor? Do you guys try to uh, to kind of apprentice by committee or how, how no, does it work? No, I think, I think we, like I said, we all like uh, teach each other I and mean, we all teach them. So they're not from somebody specifically, but they all do like different things. Uh, I mean, on top of that, I, I have my manager and the manager's assistant. I mean, okay. it's a big place, so you got to run yeah. it more like a company. Right. And uh, so then my, my apprentices, they all, I see, like, what, what are they good for, right? So some of them run the register. Some of them, you know, help me with advertising, man. Some of them, like, do certain things around the shop. I got a, a, a guy that's great, uh, uh, money. He, uh, he, he, he can fix everything, man. He's just, like, a smart guy, so he yeah. helps a lot around there, man. And... Uh, uh, but, but, but yeah, like so, I, I try to look for specific tasks for all of them. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and yeah. everything works pretty good. That that's a that's a really progressive approach. I my business coach talks about how when he hires for his company and they have a hundred plus employees, when they hire for the for the company, they don't partic they don't necessarily hire someone for a position. They hire someone for the qual their unique abilities. And exactly. he said, if if we find the right person, we'll create a position for that person, yeah. even if it doesn't exist before they show up. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that sounds like similar to what you're doing. You're finding unique things that your apprentices bring to the table. Yeah, like, yeah, for sure, man. Uh, I'm, I was reading uh, this book uh, on uh, something called systems thinking. Mm -hmm. um, what's it? What's it? What's the name of the the writer? Um, the book is called Systems Thinking. No, it's it's about fi systems thinking, but uh, the book the book is called The Fifth Discipline. Um, okay. I can I can remember the name of the uh, writer right now, but uh, but he explains how uh, uh, systems thinking is more like a way that you know, like to run a business based on more like relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 he's like, let's say if you were to have the best engine from any car, like the best transmission, the best, you know, uh, 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 this yeah. system and put it all together, it wouldn't work because he's not meant, you know, for to be with that, yeah. right? Yeah. So he just talks about how, like, when, when you're hiring people, you got to you gotta make sure that they can be, like, that they're able to, like, work together, right? Mm -hmm. And and. and and you don't want to hire them from the shoulders down. 
you you actually want to see what what kind of input they can put in, into your company mm -hmm. and and because because systems don't learn or like companies don't learn it's like the people in there that learn so if you can work with them specifically with them instead of instead of like trying to apply a system try to amplify what they are and then use that mm -hmm. i think that's a better system than trying to be like okay this is how things are going to be done here no mm -hmm. no no. ask them, hey how do you think we can do this like what would be the easiest way for you to do this mm -hmm. and then like at all times trying to like collaborate with them yeah. to come up with like better things because they feel like they're being part of of, of, of your vision you know and, and yeah. that really helps so. yeah yeah absolutely and I, like i said that's a really progressive way to to approach it it's and it's something that's like a newer it's a newer idea because we used to really just like plug people into giant systems you know exactly. i mean not necessarily in the tattoo industry but just in, in general in industry yeah. in general yeah and uh and, and and it's a it's a great approach and i think it's an approach that makes for makes for happier people and more successful companies and more successful um uh, a clientele or, or happier clientele and uh and everything in between yeah and then, then at the end of the day they feel happy because they're being a contribution mm -hmm. they they are doing something they're not just being manipulated to do what you want you're actually giving them the freedom to to say hey you know what guys you're contributing to to this you know you're being so so another another book was talking about the difference between um uh, being enlisted in 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 in, in your company mm -hmm. uh in somebody's vision like the vision of the company mm -hmm. and, and 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 then the other one it was just like uh, uh just complying right to just doing enough to keep your job mm -hmm. and and most people I, mean, I guess depending on the kind of people you have working for you, but when you have people that en enlisted, they want to be part of it. Like they, they believe in your vision, mm -hmm. and they feel like they're contributing, you know, being a contribution. And by by that, they're at all times they're just trying hard because they 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 seeing something grow that they're creating. Yeah. And the people who's just complying, they're just doing barely enough to keep their jobs, and mm -hmm. it, it it makes a huge difference. On yeah, that. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Man, yeah, that's great, and that's it's so impressive that you're running a shop that size, and that you're able to to break away from it, leave 20, 19 people behind, uh, <laughs> and come here and 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 feel confident that you can show back up and everything is running. Oh yeah, the yeah, way yeah. Because like I said, they're they're trying to take care of their shop too. They're not just yeah, taking care of my it. shop, right? right? So that yeah. that makes a big difference. Yeah. So. Have you considered opening a, another location? Do you think you're going to stick with one? Or yeah, I think I mean, yeah, uh, as always, you you always trying to like grow your business or you know grow mm -hmm. grow what you're doing. So so that that that's coming up this year. I think I'm, I've been thinking about expanding, like opening up another shop because in Dallas or in another town. Yeah, I think in Dallas, man. Yeah. I want I want to be close from them because I, I want to have that connection with everybody. Yeah. So so that that's gonna be the toughest part, man. Like not being there with them at all times. And if even if I did something like that, I think I'll I'll probably do something where I rotate everybody so we can all be you know a big family. But that's yeah. definitely that's definitely gonna be a challenge because my system is based on. Like I say, relationships. So yeah. when you when you break that a little bit, it, it might work, you know, a little bit different. But but yeah. I, I think I can do it. I just gotta adjust, you know, a little yeah. bit, some some stuff in there. So yeah, we'll see. If, if someone wanted to get um, tattooed either on the road or, or at your shop, are you are you still booking? Are you ha what's the process for you? Well, right now I'm not uh, necessarily taking appointments, man. I, at some point I booked myself for like three years, and uh -huh. and and it was it was just a mess. And now I'm I'm staying more open, like about six months. But uh, but I'm just trying to like work on big pieces and until I finish them, you know, I know that yeah. I'll do another one. Yeah. But lately at shows, I've been just like designing something that I like mm -hmm. and then I just like post it, you know, uh, that week or whatever. And I'm like, hey, you know, who wants to get this? Which yeah. I was considering that. I was like, man, it's, it's not a good thing for the clients, you know, because in a short notice, they got to fly to where you are. Yeah. And I want them to like make plans and be more prepared, like just considering their time more than anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna start like at, at doing it like three weeks away or something, like yeah. design something and posting it for the show. So, yeah. but that's the, yeah, that's the easiest way right now to get yeah. tattooed, like at a convention, maybe if you want a big piece. Yeah, so. and and I think you know that that just in general, our, the clientele has has grown enough and are and, and uh, are understanding enough that they're they're becoming more collectors. They're open to the idea of of. Um, of just collecting something that, that you're interested in doing, and uh, and it's amazing the the links that they'll go to to get tattooed, to drop everything and fly and yeah. spend an entire day and yeah you know, yeah it's and a that's uh I mean I feel blessed right like I yeah. I always see it happening but I never take it for granted man I'm yeah. always like so grateful that people wanna come spend you know like three four thousand dollars in a weekend and and yeah. just fly you know like out here just in the middle of nowhere drop everything they're doing just to get tattooed by me yeah. like the kid i tattoo uh, uh the, the the last two days he was like man i've been waiting to get in uh, with you for almost five years oh wow and i've been like emailing and your page always says book book close and, and yeah. i never get any answers and 
And that, uh, in a way, that makes me feel bad. I'm like, man, I wish I had time to tattoo like everybody, but but right. it's just not possible, right? Yeah. But uh, when 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 they show that appreciation, man, it makes you wanna deliver. You know, it makes yeah. you wanna do everything you can to make sure they're happy. And yeah. when they leave and they're like, man, this is one of my favorite tattoos. He's got a great collection, so for for for, for him to be saying that, it was just like, yeah, re really cool. You know, that, that I think that's uh, I find more satisfaction on making the client happy than getting an award or getting yeah. the money or anything like that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just cool when they're like, they have some expectations for you and you're able to deliver. Yeah. Real quickly before we wrap it up, on, on that point, do you find yourself when, when someone says, I've been waiting for five years to get in with you or I've been, and, and uh, you know when that person walks through the door and they sit down, they are expecting the best tattoo that they've ever seen in their lives. Yeah, you know what I mean? Exactly. Do you feel, um, do you feel any sort of, of pressure? Do you feel like, oh, I can't afford to have an off day? Yeah. Uh, everything has to go perfectly today? No, not at all, man, because honestly, like on every single tattoo that I do, I put my 100 percent on it. Right. Yeah. Like I do. I try to do as best as I can. So uh, so I don't I don't ever feel pressure. I don't feel like, oh, because, you know, I always tattoo everybody. Like if I was tattooing my wife or my brother or my dad, you know, like I, everything I do, I try to put my 100 percent on it. I always think of the how long the tattoo is going to last. Like, I, I, you know, like if I'm not going to finish it, I'm always like, hey. You're gonna have to come back. I, I know, you know, I gotta finish it, but I give you a discount or something. So mm -hmm. I never feel pressure by that, man. Like I think I, I just do my best, you know, in every yeah. single tattoo, and that solves, you know, all those problems. So yeah, absolutely. Well, man, thanks so much for your hey, time. I appreciate thanks it. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, it, Instagram is just remember remember uh, underscore tattoos underscore tattoos. Rember so underscore if you guys tattoos. don't already follow him, you should. And uh, thanks for your time. Hey, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Awesome, man. That was great.